Well, one of those boxes they open the door. start with 642, 642, I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. When the chords of heaven ring, 
Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. And the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought to not live any longer. I found that he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. I think that's reasonable yeah. to assume. <laughs> yes, Noreen. Um, was Nero emperor? Was what? Was Nero emperor? Yes. Yeah, but, and we don't know he was, him. but he wasn't, um, he hadn't gone crazy yet. Right, right. He was still in his quote-unquote sane years. Right, right. <laughs> yes. But, um, but we don't know that Paul ever was able to appeal to him. Yeah, well, I mean, not in the Bible, but um, according to, you know, the historical record that we have, oh, okay. he was beheaded in uh, 64 AD by Nero. But not the first time. I they think he went before him twice. The first time um, he was released, and then he was arrested again, they say. And then that time he was beheaded. Okay, so it's in historical. Sources. It's in the historical records, but nothing in the Bible that says that. So, yeah. So, uh, nothing happened with uh, Paul's case for, for two years in Caesarea until finally... Felix was replaced by Festus as the governor of Judea. Now, like we talked about last time, Felix had mishandled the political situation between the Jews and the Greeks, and he took some harsh military action against the Jews in Caesarea, and he was called back to Rome, and he was replaced with Festus. And Festus was the governor from uh, AD 58 to 62. And he had such a short reign because uh, he died. So his reign ended when he died. And uh, Josephus describes Festus as a noble ruler who did his best to rid Israel of gangs and robbers. We don't know a whole lot about him other than that. But um, he was a new governor and he didn't waste any time uh, on the job. Uh, it says that just after three days... He heads down to Jerusalem to try and, you know, sort some things out. Some of the problems that Felix had had uh, with the Jewish leaders and just to deal with things and to also keep peace in the land because um, Judea did not like Rome. You know, there was constant friction. And that was part of the problem uh, that Felix had was dealing with the Jews. And uh, he didn't know how to handle it correctly. Um, in fact, he probably would have lost his life, but I think it was his uncle that interfered uh, to Caesar, so that that didn't happen. But um, so there was this constant conflict, you know, between the Jews and the Romans, and uh, this would, you know, ultimately result in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. by the Romans. So Roman governors like Felix, you know, they didn't help a lot keeping the, the peace between the, the Jews and the Romans. So Festus, you know, he heads to Jerusalem right away to, to meet with the Jewish officials there in order to, you know, try and establish some, some good relationships with them um, in his, uh, his first week in office. And uh, like we talked about before, the Sanhedrin, you know, they were the, the highest ruling body of Jews. And they were located in Jerusalem. And so Festus, he would have been anxious to meet with them. 
and just try to come to some, some solutions uh, the various problems. I'm sure they had a long list of problems that, uh, you know, never got solved, kind of like our own country. Uh, but, you know, there were just constant things that needed needed working out. But um, he had a lot of work to do and constantly, you know, he was trying to clean up Felix's mess too that he kind of left behind. So verse 2 says that the chief priests and the Jewish rulers, they appeared before him and presented their charges against Paul. So it's kind of, it's really kind of amazing in a way that the first thing on their agenda, uh, the first thing on their agenda is, uh, you know, this issue with Paul, because this is an old issue. This is two years ago um, that, uh, you know, they had brought him before Felix. He's been in prison all this time. Felix didn't want to uh, do anything about his case because he wanted to do the Jews a favor and he also was waiting for Paul to give him a bribe Which he never did So, uh, so uh, But still after two years they have this much hatred for Paul That this is the first thing you know that they they want taken care of so uh, Festus probably was a little surprised by this You know, but with all the problems like I said, that the Jews had going on, um, you know, they should have had to focus on many other things. Um, instead, they're wasting all their time, you know, trying to take care of this, which is out of their hands because God's in control of this whole thing anyway. And so they're always, they're out trying to destroy, um, you know, the, the spreading of the gospel, which they're not going to be able to do. Their hatred for Jesus still, after all these years, you know, and those that follow Jesus, like Paul. So, they, um, they have this mission to, to get Paul destroyed, and so that's, that's all that's really consuming their, their minds night and day is uh, this issue of Paul. So, verse 3 says they requested uh, Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem but they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way and Festus answered <clears throat> Paul's being held at Caesarea and I and myself are going there soon let some of your elders come with me if the man has done anything wrong and they can press charges against him there so the Jewish leaders they asked uh, Festus to have Paul brought to Jerusalem, but it was for a dishonest reason. Um, you know, they were only looking for a way to murder Paul. Um, now, back in chapter 23, remember the 40 men that vowed not to eat anything until they had killed Paul? And that's the whole reason why he was in Caesarea in the first place, because uh, the centurion heard about it. And he sent him on over to Felix so that he wouldn't lose his life. And now they're just scheming another plot to have uh, Paul murdered by sending him back the other way, going back to Jerusalem, and that they would have this ambush waiting to uh, have him killed before he gets there. So, um, if they can convince Festus, you know, to have him transferred, it's it's about it was about sixty miles, and there are a lot of places along the way where they could have they could have easily done this. But um, you know, the, it, again, it just kind of boggles your mind because these rulers of the Jewish people they were supposed to uphold the law of God, right? And here they are trying to murder Paul. They couldn't come up with anything that, uh, you know, any charges that could hold any, any water at all, you know, and they couldn't convict him of, of any kind of crime, and yet they just wanted him dead. Uh, very familiar to a few years before that, what they did with Jesus. They couldn't convict Jesus of anything either, but they just had to have him killed, and they couldn't rest until they, they had uh, Jesus crucified. And so... Kind of the same thing is going on here, except for the fact that with Jesus, you know, God allowed it to happen for his glory and for all those reasons. Here, he's not going to let it happen because he has other things for Paul to do. Um, 
But uh, here they are, you know, still, they're trying to, they're the leaders of Israel, trying to set the example to the Jewish people of what's right and what's wrong. And here they are, you know, scheming this murderous plot against Paul. It's just, it's crazy. Um, but Festus, he quickly, you know, turns them down. Um, and while he's a, he's a newbie, you know, he's a, he's a new kid on the block here, but he's not naive. Um, he probably, he may have even read, you know, about the case two years ago where they had tried to kill Paul and was probably, you know, they probably realized they were up to no good with whatever they were, they were trying to plan here. Um, so he says, you know, I'm going to be back in Caesarea in a few days, and if your guys want to, um, you know, try and convict him, then come back with me when I go back. And until then, you know, he's going to remain there. And uh, so he doesn't give in to their, their tactics here. Um, and we need to point out, too, you know, like I said, that this God's hand is in all this. Um, he probably... You know, he, there's scriptures that talk about he, sometimes he works in the hearts and the minds of men to accomplish his purposes and goals. And probably was working through Festus to, you know, to turn them down and to discourage them and so that, you know, the, the proper result would happen. Yeah, Noreen. And Festus, this was uh, a, not necessarily a Christian, but he was He was born into it. His parents, his father was a Roman citizen. So, yeah, um, yeah. So that he has that to his advantage, you know, uh, which he's already taken advantage of it. You know, when the centurion was trying to discourage him, you know, he said, "You know, I'm a Roman citizen." Uh, by the way, so that quickly ended, and then now he's got rights as a Roman citizen, you know, to. To have this trial here in Caesarea, you know, because um, it's a Roman court, and like I said, you know, if he if he was a Roman citizen, they probably easily could have had Paul uh, transferred back there. But because he is a Roman citizen, you know, he has he has certain rights, so it's not so easy. So you know, Paul is is just amazing here. He's tried and tried again, and every time he's tried, there's no conviction. There's no crime, but still, he never gets released. Yes? It, always, it seems to be like the, the Jews are always getting somebody else to do their dirty work. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, they're, they are. It's, yeah, well, it was just a wicked time, you know. They were just not, they weren't following the law. And uh, like so many times in Israel's history, you know. <laughs> They, uh, they weren't doing what the Lord wanted them to do. So, uh, verse 6. So after spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, and they brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. <laughs> so after a few days, Festus returns to Caesarea, and then on the very next day, you know, he's Johnny on the spot. He wants to get this thing taken care of, and the Jews come over, and so they, they bring up all these accusations again against Paul, but nothing that they could prove in court. So it really doesn't do them any good. Uh, it's probably the same charges that they brought up two years before that he was trying to start riots. That he was introducing this new sect and that he had violated you know the temple by bringing this uh gentile into the temple um but you know as before he was innocent of these charges and he couldn't prove anything so paul made his defense in verse 8 he says i've done nothing wrong against the jewish law against the temple or against caesar 
Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? So now, just a few days earlier, he strongly refused the Jews' request, you know, to move Paul to Jerusalem to have this trial. But now, for some reason, he's changed his mind. Uh, maybe after hearing the, the situation, um, may, you know, his ambition is probably very political and he wants to do the Jews a favor. Maybe he's thought about, you know, what they had said. Maybe they came to him with a bribe. Who knows what all, you know, is going on in his mind here. But it doesn't seem like he really cares whether Paul suffers injustice or not. He just wants to do the Jews a favor. Um, so he uh, he asked for Paul's permission, though, as a Roman citizen. Like I said, he had rights; they couldn't just move him. That he had to um, probably didn't realize how smart Paul was, and what was going on here. But uh, tries to get his permission to do this, but Paul sees right through the whole thing, you know, and knows that they're just out for his blood. So once again, you know, his Roman citizenship, uh, you know, saves him. Verse 10, Paul answered, I'm now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I've done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you yourself very well know. I, however, if, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I don't refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, and no one has a right to hand me over to them, I appeal to Caesar. And after Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you shall go. So, like I said, uh, being a Roman citizen, you know, um, Paul had the authority to, to request this uh, appeal. <clears throat> now, Paul reminds the court that. You know, a Roman citizen ought to be judged in a Roman court. He's in a Roman court. There's no reason for him to go back to Jerusalem. That's just going to give the Jews uh, an unfair advantage. And basically, you know, he was going to he'd be put to death. He wouldn't even get there because they're plotting to kill him along the way. Um, and to be judged by their uh, Jewish laws, which they will pervert, you know, in order to convict Paul. So immediately, you know, Paul, he opposes the whole idea. And also you have to remember, Paul was one of these guys. He was a, sin, a part of the Sanhedrin, you know, himself. So, you know, he knows all of their tricks and everything, too. So he knows he's not going to get a fair trial there. He's not really getting one, a fair trial here, either. Um, but, you know, handing him over to the Jews, you know, that's just going to give them the noose to hang him with. So he's not ready to do that so he says you know if I've done anything you know then I don't mind dying but if, if I haven't done anything I, I'm not going to just die for no reason so so he even he even rebukes Festus here for not acting justly according to the, to the knowledge that he has concerning you know Paul's situation here Festus knows Paul's not guilty and there's no evidence um but like I said, kind of like Felix, he just he wants to do the Jews a favor. He knows he has to work with them. Paul will be long gone, and he has to stay and work with these Jews for many years to come. So, you know, that's what he's thinking about. Now, Paul's appeal, it would take him far away from these Jewish leaders who are full of lies and murderous plots and his, his appeal would also take him to Rome, which was actually would fulfill uh, the prophecy that God had made to Paul earlier on. Um, and Paul wasn't using this appeal to delay justice, you know. He, he wants to use it to vindicate himself because he is innocent. So Festus, he conferred with the advisors, and he accepted the appeal. But uh, Festus is not going to be happy with this appeal going through because this is going to make Festus look bad, you know. Um, you know, it kind of puts him in a bad light because um, the court didn't have anything on Paul. As, as he says later, you know, to King Agrippa, you know, the court doesn't have anything on Paul and to send him over to Caesar, 
without any crimes, it makes him look incompetent. You know, like he hasn't, here he is his first week on the job. <laughs> and uh, he can't, he, what he needs to do is set Paul free, you know, and that would show his competence. But because of the, because he gave it to the Jewish leaders and was trying to do them a favor, then, uh, you know, he was trying to persuade Paul to move back to Jerusalem. And because he did that, now he's in this situation he can't get out of because now Paul knows his rights and he appeals to Caesar. And now he's got to send him to Caesar, but there's nothing to send him to Caesar on. So um, so this does not look good for, uh, for Festus. But um, in a little bit in Festus' favor is the fact that King Agrippa is going to come and visit him, and uh, he's going to listen to Paul as well, and so it won't just be on uh, Festus anymore because both uh, Agrippa and Festus, you know, he'll have his input and he can bring King Agrippa into the situation, so he's lucky for that. But um, but otherwise, it just kind of makes him look bad. <clears throat> A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea, to pay their respects to Festus. So Festus, like I said, you know, he's he's new on the job, and so King Agrippa, he comes to kind of pay this complimentary, complimentary visit, you know, uh, because he's the new governor in town. And that's just kind of something that they would do. And uh, Agrippa's domain and Festus' domain kind of overlap because um, Agrippa had the authority over the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, the, he was responsible for the, the money, and also he was responsible for appointing the high priest. But Festus also had a jurisdiction because, you know, he was governor over the whole area of Judea. So they, they kind of uh, both ruled certain aspects of, uh, of this area, so... Um, and it says the visit lasted many days, so it was probably they did a lot of um, a lot of political talking and a lot of parties and things like that. Probably now this is uh, this is Herod Agrippa the second. I know all these get all confusing because there's Herod here and Herod there all through the Bible, um, but this is Herod Agrippa the second. So I'm going to kind of outline it for you a little bit. Um, so you can kind of get a grasp on who this is. So this is Herod Agrippa II. So his great-great-grandfather is Herod the Great, the one that killed the babies in Bethlehem. His uncle, Herod Antipas, he's the one that killed John the Baptist, and he's the one that Jesus, when he was tried before Pilate, Pilate sent him over to Herod. That's Herod Antipas. Okay, that's his uncle. Um, so his father is Herod Agrippa the first. He was the one that beheaded John the Apostle and tried to have Peter also killed, but then Peter escaped from prison. Remember? So that that's his dad. Remember, he was eaten. He was, he was eaten by worms in the same town in Caesarea. Because the people were shouting, he's a god, and because he, he didn't uh, say, no, I'm not, I <laughs> think God sent these worms to, to, to kill him. So when this happened, uh, Herod Agrippa II, who is this Herod here, uh, he was only 17 years old. And so he was pretty young to kind of fill in for his father and take over all the, the territory that, uh, that, that Herod uh, was over it. So the Romans, they gave him a portion of that territory, kind of the northeast portion of, Pal of Palestine. Uh, but later, as he grew older, he would be given more territory. Um, now, Bernice, this is Herod Agrippa II's sister. Um, and she's also the sister of Drusilla. Remember Felix's wife, Drusilla, from the last chapter? Mm -hmm. This is her sister, but this is also Herod Agrippa's sister, and uh, so she had a lot of a lot of uh, marriages, and um, 
she uh, she was a mistress to King Agrippa, even though he's she's he's her brother. So the Herods have a really messed up family, and it's uh, got a lot of uh, they were they were all kind of crazy in some way. Or another. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, we'll have to stop there. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Paul. We thank you for his uh, willing his willingness to to uh, preach the gospel and to to preach it wherever he was. Stand up before kings and governors, and we thank you for his boldness. And um, mm -hmm. we thank you for your sovereignty that you are in control and over over all these things. And we thank you that. We can trust in that and know that, you know, no one has the right to take our life unless you will it to be so. And and uh, everything is in your hands, so we thank you that you are sovereignly in control. We pray, Lord, as we go into our time of worship this morning, you be with us as we study your word, as we sing and lift up praises before you, Lord, be with our hearts and minds. And be with our fellowship time, we ask it in Christ's name. 